Okay, well, I'm Robert Wright. I'm a visiting professor of science and religion here at Union Theological Seminary. Um, and I want to thank you all for, uh, for coming tonight, especially in the face of somewhat forbidding weather. Uh, I hope you find that the conversation um, justifies the effort you spent to get here. Um, in, in the event that you find that this is not as intellectually stimulating as you had hoped, uh, there will be later tonight the Republican presidential debate. Um, so one way or another, I think I can guarantee uh, entertainment of the highest order. So this is the, uh, the second in a series of conversations called Contentions that we're having at Union in which we contend with big issues and sometimes contend with each other on the stage. <clears throat> and I want to thank the Templeton Foundation, the John Templeton Foundation, for making this series of conversations possible. And also thank Un Union Theological Seminary for also making it possible and for uh, wel welcoming me here uh, this year as a visiting professor. Um, let me introduce my fellow uh, discussants. Uh, first, uh, Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein is, uh, has, has been named, I don't know when this was, but uh, a, a MacArthur genius genius award winner. I put the air quotes there, not because I doubt that Rebecca is a genius, but because that's not technically the name of the award that's known as the MacArthur Genius Award. But anyway, uh, she was given that. And if you're wondering uh, what could possibly be more impressive than winning that, well, only two months ago, she received the National Humanities Medal given to her by President Obama himself in uh, the White House. You've also been named, I think, is it Humanist of the Year by the American Humanist Association? and free thought heroin, with an E at the end, by the Freedom from, Religious, from Religion Foundation. Um, she's written uh, 10 books, either fiction or nonfiction. Uh, most recently, Plato at the Googleplex, Why Philosophy Won't Go Away, and least recently, a novel called The Mind-Body Problem, which I will uh, mention again um, before long. Um, David Chalmers has also won his share of laurels. I guess m most recently you were elected to membership in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, is that right? Which is quite a distinction, congratulations on that. Um, you're probably best known for your book, The Conscious Mind, uh, in, in 1996, we'll talk about that. Uh, you've written other books, uh, Constructing the World, The Character of Consciousness. Um, you've co-edited or, or edited uh, several uh, philosophy volumes, written a whole bunch of papers. Uh, you're professor of philosophy in, at NYU and also at the Australian National University still and still director of their Center for Consciousness Studies or something? Center of Con for Consciousness. Um, so uh, before we get started, I want to set the stage a little, uh, a little bit for our, for our conversation. So the very famous philosopher Thomas Nagel who was also Rebecca's dissertation advisor when she got her PhD in philosophy at Princeton, um, wrote a very well-known essay called What Is It Like to Be a Bat? And I read it decades ago, and I don't honestly remember very much about it, but I remember uh, one thing I took away from it, which is that one way of characterizing what we mean when we say an animal has consciousness is that it is like something to be that animal. So even if we don't know what it's like to be a bat, if we believe it's like something to be a bat, then we're saying that the bat is conscious, the bat has consciousness. That's, that's one way of, of describing what we mean by consciousness, not the only way by any means, but I have found that it has a, a kind of virtue uh, because when I confront people who insist that consciousness does not exist, and there are people, including philosophers, who say that consciousness does not exist, I like to say to them, but wait a second, is it like something to be you? And I've never had anyone say no. So they say, they say yes. And, and I found that that can lead, that can allow you to kind of push the conversation in a direction where sometimes they may wind up acknowledging that, okay, this, this thing we, we mean by consciousness is actually, uh, it's, it's in some sense a thing, uh, and there are questions we, we should ask about it. Now, there are a couple basic kinds of questions you can ask about consciousness. There's the why question, you know, why is consciousness here? What's it for? Uh, why, why is there subjective experience? Why is it like something to be alive? 
Um, because after all, with most, most uh, features of a human being, like hands, we have an explanation. You know, we think hands are here because they're good at grasping, so natural selection selected them. So you can ask the same question about consciousness. What is it for? There are how questions about consciousness. Um, you, can, you, you can ask, well, how on a kind of moment-by-moment -moment basis does consciousness take shape? Like right now, what's going on with my consciousness? So, for example, some people say, well... Uh, a lot of people actually think, I think, that consciousness is in some sense generated by the brain. Well, you can ask, well, what exactly does that mean? I mean, when we say that steam is generated by a steam engine, we have a very clear picture. We can trace out, you know, from molecules moving faster. We can just draw the little pictures. It's a very straightforward explanation. What would the corresponding story be for how consciousness um, is generated? Now, I think that these days there are a lot of philosophers, there are a lot of answers that have been given to these questions, of course, but I think there are a lot of philosophers now who, who appreciate the difficulty of answering these questions, how challenging they are, and I think that wasn't always the case. I, I think <clears throat> some decades ago, uh, there was a different climate in philosophy, so at, at mid-century, mid-20th century, there was more of a sense that, you know, if you just think about consciousness in a level-headed way, define your terms clearly, the problem either goes away or assumes very manageable form. Um, so a famous example is Gilbert Ryle, who wrote the book The Concept of Mind, which popularized the phrase the ghost in the machine, which he was using kind of dismissively, in other words, dismissing the idea that we need to think about some ghost-like thing floating around uh, near the brain. Now, a student of his was Daniel Dennett, who four decades later wrote uh, the book Consciousness Explained, very well-known book, which uh, did not make exactly the argument Ryle had made, but did preserve that spirit of confidence that if we think clearly enough about consciousness, uh, we can handle this um, with no problem. Now, I wouldn't say that Dennett's book was the last gasp of that kind of confidence. I mean, Dennett is still confident. There are people who share his confidence. But I do think that since that book, there's been a, a kind of waning of this kind of self-confidence and more and more um, an appreciation that, uh, that, that consciousness is, is a kind of a difficult um, question. And there's, there's, I think, and I'll, I'll ask what my discussants think about this, but I think there is also more ferment in the sense of looking for theories that are adequate to the challenges of, of uh, grasping consciousness. Uh, and that includes coming up with new, creative, sometimes wild theories, and also uh, reviving some theories that had been more or less abandoned because they seemed too wild. Um, so I think there's a, a lot of that kind of ferment. Um, but I certainly think that there is more awareness within philosophy now of what you could call, I think, the weirdness of consciousness. Now, by weirdness, I don't mean, whoa, isn't it weird to be conscious? Sometimes it is. You know, living in two, 2015 in America, sometimes it feels very weird to me. Uh, but that's not what I mean. What I, what I mean is the recognition that consciousness demands an explanation, and yet a recognition that it's not like the things that, conscious, that, that science has traditionally um, been good at, uh, at explaining. Um, now, finally, there's, there's another, another point related to at least what I mean by weirdness, and, and I'm here too, I'll be curious as to uh, what, um, what they have to say about this. But my own view is that it isn't just the case that people who think that if we just think about consciousness in this level-headed, very kind of scientific materialist way, the problem will go away. It isn't just that they're wrong. It's that what they believe is the opposite of the truth in my view. In other words, in my experience, it is by thinking about things in a very scientific way, even a scientific materialist way, <clears throat> thinking of natural selection as just this, this kind of nuts and bolts physical process, which I do, thinking of the brain as just this physical machine. In my own experience, it's, it's, it's having that perspective that leads you to appreciate kind of the weirdness of uh, consciousness. Um, now, this story over the last few decades of kind of a growing appreciation of the difficulty of the problem and in a way a growing intellectual humility in philosophy actually intersects with the biographies uh, of both of our, our guests tonight uh, in, in different ways. Um, I think uh, David's uh, 
uh, David's role is, is uh, quite well known. Uh, his book, The Conscious Mind in 1996, and the paper that preceded it, uh, really helped fix attention within philosophy on the difficulty of the problem. <clears throat> uh, he coined the term the hard problem of consciousness, by which he didn't mean consciousness generally is just really hard, but he meant to, to acknowledge that on the one hand, there are some problems, some questions about consciousness that maybe aren't that hard that you can answer, but you shouldn't be fooled into thinking that if you come up with plausible answers to those, you've done all of the work and really solved the whole thing. There's a set of questions that, that David puts under the rubric. Hard problem, I think they, they correspond maybe roughly to the kinds of questions I raised earlier, the why question, the how question, but I'll let uh, David speak to that. Uh, so, so this is this David's kind of uh, the kind of landmark status of his book and that paper, well known. I'm not making any news here tonight by saying that. I, I, I do want to make a little news now, though, because less known is the way Rebecca's biography intersects with this story of uh, of how a, a tremendous kind of confidence within philosophy slowly yielded to, I think, greater humility. It turns out that there's a kind of a backstory to the writing of her first book, uh, the novel called The Mind-Body Problem, um, that is related to all this. So, Rebecca, do you want to talk about that a little? Oh, sure. Um, so, I was, well, first of all, when I, when what was to be called the hard problem of consciousness, when it was entitled that, um, when I it, it came against it, I was a, an undergraduate, uh, and uh, it was it was the great intellectual experience of my life. Actually, um, I was coming uh, from a background in physics. Um, I was a hardcore reductionist. I believed that you know physics could ultimately answer everything. And I mean, of course, our we are physical objects, and you know, we're bi biology can be reduced to chemistry, and chemistry can be reduced to physics. And when we finally get down to you know the ultimate laws of nature and fine-grained descriptions, everything will be captured and encapsulated. And I was actually writing uh, the subway, and uh, I read about this in this little essay, but had a series of experiments where, bam, it just hit me. Uh, that no kind of physical description could ever yield all the qualities of what it's like uh, to be a subjective, uh, to be a subject, uh, that this subjectivity couldn't be contained uh, in a physical description. And I don't, you know, it was just, it was, it was, it was mind blowing. It was, I, I say it was one of the most exciting intellectual experiences. Was this when you were a graduate student at Princeton? No, or? I was an undergraduate right across the street at, at Barnard. At Barnard. Yeah. Okay. And um, I, I say it was like the most uh, exciting intellectual experience. It was probably one of the most exciting experiences of my life. It was just the whole world changed for me. Um, anyway, um, I went, when I did go to graduate school, uh, I, um, I was actually just going to do foundations of quantum mechanics, but I couldn't find anybody there who I wanted to work with. And then I read, what is it like to be a bat? And I thought, oh, this guy seems to, he's, he's got an idea of, uh, of what this amazing problem is. And so I ended up uh, working with John Nagel. I was coming from a strictly science, uh, a philosophy of science background. I was being supported by an NSF. So I was mostly interested in turning it into a problem in philosophy of science, the conditions for reduction. What is it to reduce one theory to another? When we reduce thermodynamics uh, to statistical mechanics, what, in such a way to be able to say that heat is nothing but molecular motion, what are the conditions that have to be satisfied? And have we done that yet with consciousness? No. Um, what is the likelihood that we're going to do that for, with consciousness? Anyway, um, so I wrote the thing. It was a very hot, except for Tom Nagel, it was an extremely hostile uh, uh, environment for talking about consciousness. Um, and I remember at my thesis, uh, my dissertation defense, um, somebody said to, uh, 
said to me, well, we had no idea that we were harboring a metaphysician in our midst, right? Uh, you know, to, to, to merely mention metaphysics, and, and, and that was a huge... So metaphysics that was, a, was a bad word. That was a huge insult. Is metaphysics <laughs> a slightly less bad word now in philosophy? I, I, oh, indeed. There's even analytic Partly metaphysics. because of the consciousness. Yeah, yeah. indeed, yeah. yeah. So, um, anyway, um, and uh, I, I found it, you know, after I left the bosom of, of, of being mentored by, by, by uh, Nagel, it was just very hostile. Nobody, I, nobody really wanted to talk to me about it. And I got very, very frustrated. Um, and I thought, <clears throat> I'm going to write a novel. First, it was a joke. Uh, I'm going to write a novel because one of the things about novels is um, you enter into subjectivity. And wouldn't that be funny to write about this problem from the point of view of a novel from the first person? And little did I know everybody would assume it was autobiographical. That was a whole other <laughs> bunch of problems that, that arose. But, um, you know, from the first person trying to explain what it was like to be this, this, this person who is obsessed with the mind-body problem um, and nobody wants to take it seriously. And, you know, so I wrote this novel. I didn't mean to be a novelist. That was not on my agenda. Um, it, but was it, was, very, it was well reviewed and taken seriously everywhere. Oh, it was extremely well, so. yes. And, you know, what really, you know, ended my philosophical career is that it became a bestseller, actually. And Big that mistake. was, you know, that was, uh, it was hard enough in those days to be a woman in philosophy, especially trying to do technical philosophy of science, and then you go and you write a sexy novel. That is implicitly a critique of the philosophy establishment. <laughs> Indeed. That becomes a bestseller. No, this is not a recipe for tenure, I would say. Yeah. No. So it was, you know, yes, I mean, and of course, you know, anybody who was not quite as stupid as I would have realized such a thing. But, um, but I did it, and it was, you know, it was a very bad career move, and then I thought, oh, well, I guess I just have to be a, a novelist, you know, so I wrote more novels, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and, and that's, but, it, but as I said, um, you know, when, and, uh, when David sort of called this the hard problem of, of consciousness and distinguished between the hard problem and the easy problems, and suddenly, you know, philosophers were, uh, were, were talking about this and really serious uh, discussion uh, started taking place. Um, and I thought, huh, hard problem of consciousness. It made my life hard <laughs> in, in, in many ways, you know, that, that you know, personally it was a, uh, but yeah, I, so, I thought it was a, it, and still is, like so, one of so the most So you became amazing. a successful novelist. That, that's a very sad story, Rebecca. My condolences. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you might, you know, it's true, you might have been, a, you might have been happier as a philosopher. You taught philosophy. You, 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 uh, I continue to teach. Yeah, yes, yeah. I do. Um, okay, yes, so you, yes. you're kind of having it both ways. So yes. David, do you want to talk a little about what you do mean by the hard problem of consciousness? Sure. Um, you know, like Rebecca, I actually started off as a uh, materialist who was very much attracted to this great chain of explanation of everything in physical terms. Um, yeah, I was always interested in the really foundational and fundamental things, and that attracts, attracted me to physics and mathematics because they seemed to explain everything, but it just seemed to me there was this one thing that was really hard to see how they'd explain, and that's consciousness. Um, everything else could be explained in terms of objective mechanisms. You, know, you could see how physical mechanisms could bring about the behaviors required for chemistry and how all that in principle put together in complicated enough ways, could give you the functions of biology, and maybe even some parts of psychology, sociology, economics, who knows, but you know, consciousness just didn't seem to be like that. It seemed to be uh, you know, subjective and not a matter of objective functioning or objective behavior. And, and just to pause briefly on that point, I mean, one thing about it is it's private, it's not publicly observable, yeah. and the things that science traditionally explains are publicly observable in the sense that more than one person can look at them, whether it's through a microscope or whatever, um, and they can kind of uh, agree on at least what the data are, and consciousness is private and qualitatively different from everything that... that if, if the reductions would go through, it would no longer be private. 
if the reductions would go, you know, if I, you I, successfully reduced it, it's one of the ways to see. Then you would have connected it to, to stuff, to physical stuff. I mean, I well, I, we shouldn't get off on this tangent. Yeah, my, my, we can talk about that. Yeah, we can. It is a, 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 a but, but, condition of reduction. Yeah. Okay. So so, go go ahead. So, um, so for me, it was always a challenge to, you know, I wanted to be a materialist and a reductionist, but this was the, the big challenge to come up with a great material reductionist theory of consciousness. And somewhere along the way, it just came to seem to me that I was banging my head against the wall, trying to come up with a materialist and reductionist theory of consciousness, and that there were really fundamental reasons why a physical theory of all this wasn't going to work. And it's tied, really, it's tied to the distinction between what later on I called the hard problem and the easy problem of consciousness. By the way, this was never meant to be a profound or original distinction. I, uh, I gave a talk at the 1994 Tucson conference on, uh, on consciousness, which was one, was one of the first big international conferences on consciousness. And in the first few minutes when I was just setting up the problem, I said, well, here's what we can call the easy problems of consciousness. Here's what we can call the hard problem of Consciousness, and then I went on to give my preferred theory of it at the time. Anyway, well, nobody remembered the, the rest of the talk about the, uh, the preferred theory of it, but ah, oh, this thing about the, uh, the hard problem. It's like, yeah, okay, everybody, everybody remembered that. Um, every, you know, Rebecca knew it was a hard problem. Everyone knew it was, a, uh, it was a hard problem. It was just a very catchy name, but it does. What this label, the hard problem of, consci of consciousness, though, encapsulates is this distinction between, well, the easy problems of consciousness are those which are fundamentally about objective behaviors and objective mechanisms. So why, how is it that we can walk around? How is it that we can respond to certain stimuli? How is it we can say certain things? These are all aspects of consciousness. Right, up, right now I'm up here sitting fairly upright on the stage saying some things in response to things you're saying. That's something you can call consciousness, but that's just objective. So we say, to, and to explain that, is something that the standard paradigms of neuroscience um, and cognitive science, you can see a picture of how they'll do that in principle. So what uh, give a mechanism that will generate those behaviors and you'll explain those things. So you mean there are physical things that are cor correlated with consciousness and we can talk about those and we kind of know what we mean by the kind of state of consciousness that might accompany them, but and strictly furthermore, speaking, And it's, furthermore, it's those can explain thing. certain phenomena the phenomena tied to behavior, mm -hmm. to responsiveness, to language. There's no principled barrier to seeing how a neural mechanism or some kind of computational process in the head couldn't be responsible for my sitting up and my wandering around and my talking about certain things and so on. But the hard problem of consciousness is not a problem about behavior. Those are what we call the easy problems. The, problem of, the hard problem of consciousness is that of subjective experience. Why does it feel like something? from the inside. And the reason why it's a distinctive kind of problem is those paradigms of explaining behavior and explaining functioning, although they work really well for the easy problems, just seem to leave the problem of subjective experience wide open. For any story you tell about how it is that I walk, talk, respond, and so on, it seems, well, in principle, that could happen without consciousness. You know, how does explaining those things <coughs> explain consciousness? And it's really that difference between the objective mechanisms uh, tied to objective functioning and the subjective experience that encapsulates the distinction. Okay. So in principle, uh, and I think we're getting toward your well-known zombie thought experiment, but in, in principle, uh, you believe that an organism could behave exactly as complexly as we behave, but it would not be like anything to be us. Without the subjective experience, that seems to you at least in principle possible, right? That's the zombie thought experiment. Imagine this planet where there's all these things that look just like us, but they don't, they don't feel pain when they put their hand in the fire. Yeah, well, this is a subtle issue, and it's best not to... I mean, it can be confusing, because I think no one... Say, I mean, I don't want to say that zombies could actually exist. I don't want to say we could create a, uh, a zombie. It may be that in this world, any being which had the complex capacities of behavior that you and I have will be conscious. But it does seem, at the very least, that we can imagine all of that functioning going on without consciousness. Or so to use a popular metaphor, we're here at the uh, Union Theological Seminary after all, and I see that I saw a few books on Bob's bookshelf before with God in the title. So uh, 
if I'm going to earn my way in the theological seminary, I need, a, need to bring God in somewhere. So imagine God creating the world, um, and God creates all of the uh, physical processes in the world, uh, hooks up a bunch of atoms and molecules doing very sophisticated things, producing a bunch of behaviors, and so maybe even the kind of behaviors that you and I are producing. It seems that it's coherent to suppose that God could have done all that and not put consciousness in. We, that would then have been a world of zombies. Mm -hmm. That is not what happened. This is not a world of zombies. But that's a way that the world could have been. There seems to be no contradiction in the idea of a zombie or a world of zombies, physically just like this, with no consciousness. Now, our world is not like that. It contains consciousness. But that kind of brings out the idea to extend this metaphor of God. The God, in creating the world, had to do some more work to put consciousness in, something over and above the physical processes. Now, take God out of that story, with apologies to the theological seminary, and then I think you get the case, a version of a case for why consciousness can't be reducible to it, physical it processes. It may be functionally superfluous, yeah. not necessary for an organism that behaves as complexly as we do. And you put it very conjecturally, but I would say two things. Um, first of all, this is actually kind of implicitly the governing assumption of behavioral science, I think. I mean, I think the average behavioral scientist thinks that uh, when I put my hand in a flame and go like that, that they can come up with an exhaustive explanation of why that happened, what caused my hand to retract without making reference to my feeling of pain. There's, you know, physical information goes up, comes down. It's certainly assumed by scientists that you can explain this complex behavior without reference to um, subjective experience. In other words, you can have a, a kind of a robotic model uh, of a human in principle that would be um, successful. Moreover, we are building pretty complicated robots. Now, it's true that for all we know, they're conscious. We can't say they're, they don't have subjective experience. On the other hand, we have an exhaustive description of why they do everything. We programmed it in. It's not a mystery. So we can say for sure in the case of robots, we don't need, whether they have subjective experience or not, we don't need to, to refer to it to explain their behavior, right? And this is this is what I meant when I thought that thinking like a scientist highlights the, the difficulty of the question. Mm. Does, that, does that make sense? Yeah, and one of the, the uh, indications of that is historical, historical that the mind-body problem, what we call, or you know, this problem, doesn't really emerge until science became sophisticated enough in the 17th century that we had a good understanding of you know, what a physical explanation was, that it was laws of matter in motion. And it's, it's just interesting that until, you know, uh, until Galileo really formulates the basic, uh, you know, formulates what motion is in mathematical terms and the kinds of properties uh, that are amenable to, uh, to physical description, mathematical description, and everything else gets dumped into the mind, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, you know, he makes a distinction between the primary and the secondary qualities, and the primary qualities are really out there and, and, in, uh, in matter, and the rest are just, you know, their cause, their experiences, because of the interactions between what's out there um, and our own sensory organs. Um, and, uh, you know, and Locke also repeats this primary-secondary distinction, but I think it actually is was original with Galileo, so much is. Um, and, you know, and then we have Descartes, uh, you know, a contemporary of, of Galileo, formulating really uh, what I think is, with all due respect to you, the problem, right, uh, that, uh, you know, um, Understanding this kind of mechanistic model of, of matter, how, why does it feel like something? Uh, you know, and he's sure it's taking place somewhere in here, the pineal, in the region of the pineal gland, but it's, um, it's, not, it's not reducible to the laws of matter and motion. So it's, I think you're right, one has to have a, a somewhat sophisticated, of course, it got much more sophisticated, Galileo. And, 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 and Descartes only had a geometrical notion of, of physical properties, not dynamic. This comes with Newton. So, you know, it gets, but it's matter in motion, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what a physical explanation is. 
uh, these mechanisms in motion, and how do we how do we get you know how it do is. we get consciousness out of that? It is fascinating and surprising just how recent the problem of of consciousness is, as we conceive of it. You just wrote a book about Plato, but I don't know what Plato, you, know, you, don't, you don't find anything happen. like the mind, Nothing. the contemporary yeah. mind-body yeah. problem yeah. in Plato. And so you know, if we did bring Plato, Plato back for his, uh, his book tour, it'd be really interesting to see what he would make of right. the, uh, the contemporary problem of consciousness. And even in Descartes, it's, it's got some elements of the contemporary version, but this particular distinctive version that really focuses on the experiential aspects, say, of perception is a little bit um, distinct from the way Descartes conceived of it, which is very much in terms of thought, for example, well, and its property. Do you find bits and pieces in... Well, he talks about, you know, Descartes. when I feel pain, yeah. uh, that is part of what it is to think. I mean, he doesn't use the word consciousness, of course. Uh, it's uh, cajetaire, you know, pense, mm -hmm. pense. Um Consciousness meant something different mm -hmm. than it meant to actually think together. We are being conscious together here. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, knowing together, really. Um, Conciencia, um, but uh, but you know I think I think it's there. You okay. know I think it's there. It's it's in 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 Descartes. I think it's especially when you want to look for the explanatory approach. To this explaining all this in terms of as you put it, the motion of matter. I find hints of that in Leibniz with yes. his example of the mill and so the, on. But Descartes yes. Descartes doesn't want to explain it all as a result he doesn't, of no. motion, yeah. right? I mean, and and, yeah. and so speaking of Descartes, I mean he is. Of course, a dualist. He thought there's the physical body, and then there's this kind of immaterial thing. I, I, I guess he was calling it a soul. I don't know, but but in any event, um, he said there's two-way interaction, right? The body can influence this immaterial thing. The immaterial thing can influence the body. That's called what interactive dualism or something, and that's not a, 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 a very good way to become popular among philosophers to say you're an interactive dualism uh, dualist. I think. But I'm, I'm curious as to how you both are kind of thinking of what consciousness is. I mean, there's, um, there's kind of two, two questions, and uh, I asked them at, at the risk of, of us winding up getting very technical in, in ways that neither I nor anybody here will understand, but let me try it anyway. I mean, there's, it seems there's two questions. Are you a dualist? Uh, not necessarily an interactive dualist. You don't have to be saying that consciousness influences the body, but he's saying that, that there's uh, there, there's some kind of separation, and its consciousness is in a, you know is different. And are you a material? Are you saying consciousness is a non-material thing? And by that, do you even mean some kind of like metaphysical substance, which I think <clears throat> not many decades ago would have been a pretty heretical thing to say. I don't know how heretical it is now, but. Can you both kind of locate yourselves on these spectrums, if, if you even are so audacious as to have clear intuitions about what consciousness is? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not a Cartesian dualist. Um, I am still a materialist. I just think matter is a hell of a lot more interesting than our present physics is telling us. Uh, and I think we know this because we're, we're matter. <clears throat> I'm pretty convinced that you know everything that is true of me is true of because of my uh, of my material uh, composition and what it's doing. Um, but uh, so matter has this property, and I think that that is that's so that's consciousness amazing, is a right? property, but you wouldn't refer to consciousness as something immaterial. Um. No, I, I would not. I, I don't believe that there's, you know, that I consist of some uh, immaterial soul. There's just too much evidence, you know, that you, you, you mess with the brain, you mess with the, uh, all the properties of, of, of consciousness. I mean, it just seems the overwhelming uh, evidence is that we are, we are material okay. things. Now, David, you wouldn't deny that if you mess with the brain, you mess with consciousness, I think, but I think you're more inclined I think you're, but aside from that, I think your, your view is different from Rebecca's, right? Yeah, although I'm somewhat agnostic about where you go once you reject reductionism. I mean, I think basically my view is you have to at least allow that consciousness, the property of consciousness, is something irreducible and perhaps fundamental in, uh, in nature. And I think it's somehow got to be regarded as an out, on a par with things like space and time and mass and charge as at least a fundamental property of nature, but that leaves open exactly where it fits in 
to that picture. And there's a number of different pictures, all of which I think are possible. One is a dualist picture where matter is autonomous and consciousness, at least the property, is somehow separate from that, not playing any particular causal role and is it, within the system. Is it generated, uh, it's a, is this epiphenomenalism? In other words, it's a byproduct of the physical thing. It is influenced by the physical thing, but doesn't influence the physical thing. So in other words, it's like my hand and the shadow of my hand. My hand yeah. influences the shadow, shadow doesn't influence my hand. That, that qualifies as dualism in your view, but it's not Cartesian because the, the immaterial thing, or whatever you want to call consciousness, is not influenced. It could be a property of matter that just doesn't influence the other properties. Right. That wouldn't require a Cartesian soul or, or ego, but it would be somewhat unattractive epiphenomenalism with consciousness not doing anything. So I'm somewhat attracted to views where you can find a role for consciousness in nature. I mean, the weirdness of consciousness, which this debate is called, consists in a number of things. One of them is very hard to explain it in physical terms, but another thing is it's very hard to see what it does in right. the physical world. The epiphenomenalist says nothing, and we all find that counterintuitive. I mean, at the very least, you think we're all here on this stage and our bodies are, our mouths are moving and we're talking about consciousness. Consciousness, surely consciousness has something to do with that. Right, well that's an interesting thing. I mean, I'd say first of all, an epiphenomenal view of consciousness, that it's like what my shadow is in my hand, raises the question, well then what is it for if it's not influencing the physical thing? Why would it have arisen <clears throat> through evolution or whatever? But you make a good point that once you get to be humans and you talk about the way you feel, in a certain sense, even if consciousness was epiphenomenal, it starts actually influencing the world um, and I think that has an in, in, intriguing... I mean, it is what we are. There's a lot of information. I mean, information has become for me, and for many people, an interesting word here. Um, that uh, it, physical states contain a tremendous amount of information, um, and consciousness contains a tremendous amount of information, mm -hmm. right? Um, when I'm writing a novel, I am describing the inner world of my characters. What is it to create a character? It's to create a subjectivity. I always forget to give them bodies, right? My editors always have to remind me, you have to tell us what they look like. I don't care what they look like. I care what the world is like for them. That, to me, is what it is to create um, a character. And, and how do I do that? I do this, you know, propositionally, right? And so there's a tremendous amount of information um, in, in being conscious, in being a conscious subject, mm -hmm. long-term um, and moment-to-moment, -moment, right? And so, um, I know somehow to me this is suggestive. I, I don't know quite how, but you know, the fact, you know, that, that there's all of that information in physical states, and consciousness is itself richly dense with information. This um, is an idea which is actually getting a lot of attention uh, right now. There are oh, people really? putting forward informational theories of consciousness, mathematical measures of information integration, and somehow that's all. Actually, I, I pursued an idea a little bit like this way back in my book in uh, The Conscious Mind in 96, of trying to look at deep ties between consciousness and information. It's very interesting, actually, to be in a conversation with these particular two people on the stage, because um, I must confess that when I was a, when I was a student, I, I read, uh, I read uh, Rebecca's book, The Mind-Body Problem, and was extremely influenced by, uh, by, by this book. It's a wonderful novel with a lot of really interesting philosophical ideas, and I particularly wow, like this is uh, better than getting a prize from Obama. <laughs> okay, well, <good>. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I remember one very memorable thing that Rebecca said in that book was we needed to focus on the body part of the mind-body problem. Too much worrying about the mind and not enough worrying about the body, and I took the real moral of that was we need to think about the intrinsic nature of physics. We don't yes. really understand the, the physical world. It's right there in that, in, that, in that book, and it's something yeah. which people have lately been rediscovering. And I think if you think about physics, for example, in informational terms, you can start to think, maybe there's, some maybe there's some room for consciousness at that level. Um, and this is what brings in Bob's book, which, uh, Bob's book, Three Scientists and Their Gods, maybe your first book, which I read in my first year of graduate school, was all about the importance of, uh, of ideas about information and three particular figures. It was what, Fred Kern and... Ed Wilson and uh, Kenneth Boulding. 
Yeah. And, and their ideas about information and making sense of a fundamental metaphysical worldview. It wasn't so much about consciousness, but I was influenced by this book as well, and I thought, hey, maybe these ideas about information are what we can bring in to think about, about consciousness. So anyway, put in these two guys' books together and mix them all up, and somehow you get an information-based theory of consciousness, which I pursued a little bit in the mid-90s, and a lot of people are right now mm. pursuing. And the idea is that maybe the fundamental stuff of the universe is somehow informational, and physics is information from the outside. That's how it connects to everything else, but somehow consciousness is information yeah. from you, the inside. You, you, you quickly um, come to panpsychism if yes. you do that. Yeah. Yes. And that's, um, the, that's the alternative, as I see it, to dualism. Yeah. Yeah. You're I either see, a dualist yeah. or a panpsychist. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and they're both weird. Weird. <laughs> that's what yeah. we're here for. Well, let's, yes. and, and, uh, Rebecca, I want to ask you to talk a little about panpsychism, because for one thing, you're a Spinoza aficionado, wrote a book about Spinoza, and I gather he was a panpsychist. Let me first say... By the way, I was, I was trying to figure out where this... Weird noise is coming from. Are you is the it, culprit? It could be me. It could be Rebecca's hair. Or it could oh, be, you're probably your, right. It could be your beard. Yeah. 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 Yes, thank you. It, it, huh? Years ago, it could have been your hair, but you're yeah, much more no. clean cut than you used to be. Now we know why you cut it. It's still um, making the noise, though. Yeah. So, so, you know, one intuition, one idea about consciousness, sentient, subjective experience is that it is a property of information processing systems. So very first one of those in organic form on this planet was some kind of bacterium that maybe had a little sentience, and then you go on, and, 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 and the more complex uh, information processors get more complexly sentient, um, and for all we know, our computers are sentient, and so on. But an alternative thought is this idea of panpsychism, which sees consciousness as much more deeply rooted in matter, it's not, you don't have to wait for bacteria in this view to have something that might have sentience, right? Can you explain what panpsychism is? Because I think it's undergoing a little bit of a revival. You've been flirting with it, David. Um, and uh, so, so, Rebecca, can you talk about that a little? Yeah, well, I, I think that David is right, that the, um, the, the alternatives are, you know, dualism, a real substance dualism, or panpsychism. That is that it is intrinsic in matter, uh, some kind of not full-fledged um, consciousness. That would be terrible uh, because we would be abusing things constantly. You know, it's bad enough what we do to animals, but, you know, what we do to, you know, that would just awful. Thought, but some kind of proto-mental something uh, that is there in matter. And that, so one of the th thoughts I had, you know, when I used to think about this full time, you know, which I don't anymore, was that our, our physical laws are, and this is, I was very influenced by Bertrand Russell here, um, are structural. They're basically giving us these, you know, because they're being captured in mathematics, mm -hmm. you know, uh, ever since, since Galileo, the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics. He wants to read this book, must first learn the language. Um, so that might be limiting, limiting the kinds of properties that we can discover in matter. Um, and, you know, we've discovered all sorts of strange, exotic properties, right? Uh, charm and strangeness and spin up and spin down. And we've gone very, very far away from what we're empirically given. But only if we can reach it through mathematical language. Well, maybe, in fact, Russell said probably matter has these sort of intrinsic properties that aren't structural, mm -hmm. but are intrinsic. Um, and we're, we can't get at them. We, we don't observe them from the outside. We can't reach them uh, through our language of physics. Um, but we know one aspect of them because we're, we're matter and we're conscious. Mm -hmm. uh, so we know that matter is capable of that, but we don't know it through either, you know, external observation because, you know, just as God could have created zombies for all I know, you're a zombie. And I think, actually, I used to think when I was in graduate school and um, talking, trying to talk to people about this other than Nagel, that there were a lot of zombies who were philosophers of mind, right? They, that was the only explanation. You know, I gave a talk, to, I gave a talk at uh, Trinity College Dublin last year, and there was a... A Berkeley scholar there who was really convinced that most philosophers and most scientists 
are in fact zombies. And he said he had a test. And he actually, he was very worried that I might turn out to be a zombie. He took me to lunch. And he asked me a series of, of 20 or 30 questions about many things. At the end, end of lunch, he told me, I've concluded that you're not a zombie. Uh, <laughs> That's excellent. That's excellent. I, yeah, so, but I don't know, so, where was well, I? Yeah, so the panpsychism. panpsychism yes. Here's a question I have about panpsychism. And, and David, since you're taking it pretty seriously, maybe uh, you can counter this objection. But I guess... If indeed panpsychism is right, and it's like something to be anything, to be like a particle revolving around another particle, now, I can, although I can't imagine precisely what it's like to be a bat, I can kind of imagine, and I kind of think it is like something, but the idea that it might be like something to be a revolving particle, I have trouble with, because consciousness seems to be associated with the, with the unpredictable. When, when, when something becomes routinized, once you've really learned how to drive to work, you become unconscious of it. Consciousness seems to be something that involves uncertainty, unpredictable, reacting to things, and not complete and utter routine like revolving around a particle. So uh, I have trouble imagining that it would be like anything to be a particle, but maybe I'm, but why do you find the, the, the worldview appealing? I don't, I'm not sure about this uh, this connection to unpredictability exactly. I mean, I wake up every morning and look at the white ceiling, and it's completely predictable. It's going to be white, but it doesn't go away. There's still a white ceiling there. So I think it's tied to information, but I'm not sure about the tie to predictability. The basic appeal of panpsychism, for me, I think comes very much from what Rebecca was saying about structure. That there's kind of a gap, and the, there's a potential gap in the understanding that physics gives us of the external world. These mathematical descriptions are wonderful, but they're very abstract. And they seem to leave, they seem to not tell us anything about the intrinsic nature of the physical world. I mean, this is a point really that goes back to a version of this can be read into Kant. You know, Kant says, well, we find out about all these things by their appearances, but does any of this science tell us about the thing in itself? You know, the electron in itself. And at least seems to be an open possibility that there are these intrinsic properties out there, we don't know what they are, very natural hypothesis. Those intrinsic properties have something to do with consciousness. That gives you a place for a consciousness in the physical world, which is nice because it seems you can have your coherent physics-based worldview and just kind of flesh it out with consciousness mm -hmm. without having to overthrow physics, which would be a pretty full order for anyone to take on at this point and maybe even give a causal role for consciousness. Now, it's true it's very weird to suppose that there's consciousness underlying the physical world and that quarks might be actually experiencing something. I mean, the, the thought is not that you know, quarks are deep in thought and you know, contemplating the mysteries of the universe, but rather... Or worrying about their mortality. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but think about, oh, I'm going to be absorbed by one of these, uh, these photons any moment now. <laughs> I mean, um, I got, Which is the worry about their mortality, wrong. I guess, in a certain yeah. sense. Yeah. But, um, um, but think about the very simplest conscious states we have. You know, there's a spectrum from you know, complex thoughts and emotions down to things like vision, and maybe pain is a bit simpler still. Now, get unimaginably simpler. Mm -hmm. Just a tiny little pinprick of light mm -hmm. in the darkness. So Leibniz has this example where he mm -hmm. says, you know, when there's like a noise in the background and you're not conscious of it at all until it stops, you know? And mm -hmm. then, you know, so there, there are all different mm -hmm. layers of, of consciousness. And if I were to describe, you know, what it was like to be me, that probably wouldn't have even entered in. I didn't realize it. But of course, on some basic proto level, I was conscious of it because suddenly, ah, it stopped. So, you know, it's not, it's not, one's not imagining, look, it's weird whatever way, I, you know, mm -hmm. one thinks about it. But let's not forget, the world is weird. We know the world that. is weird. Yeah. Quantum mechanics has told us Now, speaking, to be, speaking the of the weird. world being weird, there's another famously weird thing is quantum physics. And another idea you've been flirting with, David, is the possibility that consciousness is what, as they say in physics, uh, collapses the wave function. For those of you who haven't been thinking about quantum physics lately, you know, there is this idea, a, a kind of one interpretation of quantum physics is that, uh, of the kind of weird results you get from quantum physics is that, well, sometimes when you ask, like, well, where is this electron, uh, there's actually no true answer until you measure it. And um, it isn't just that you don't know the answer, it's like there is no answer. The, 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 the electron is 
you can think of it as in a bunch of different places or in no place, but it's in superposition. All you can say for sure is there's a probability, different probabilities that when you measure it, it will be found in one place. In any event, when you measure it, you do get a definite result. Okay, it's in this place. And some people say, well, all that means is that interaction of the particle with the measuring device forces, or inter interaction of the wave forces it to collapse into a particle. But there's also this view that it's actually the observation, it's the person monitoring the measuring device, it's the observation, it's consciousness that forces <clears throat> quantum reality to assume definite form, right? And that seems to me if that's the case, it could be a couple of weird things. It could be, you could be back to in a certain sense a kind of Cartesian view where there's an interact, you know, consciousness is this immaterial stuff that does influence the physical world. You could, you could be weirder and be like, you know, some kind of Barclayan idealism where, not that I actually know what Barclayan idealism is, but what I imagine to me is that all in some is, sense... All there is is consciousness. All there is is consciousness, and the rest is, a, what you see out there is, is a construction of consciousness, right? So th this seems, in some sense or another, kind of extreme doctrine, but maybe you both have something to say about it. David, I know you're actively flirting with it. Yeah, this is one of the classic interpretations of quantum mechanics. It goes back to von Neumann and Wigner and many of the, the founding greats. Um, at the same time, it's not really taken at all seriously these days, I think, by the scientists and philosophers who think seriously about quantum mechanics. And I've come to think that's a bit of a shame because it's an idea which I think deserves some serious exploration, not least because if you're looking for a role for consciousness in the physical world, this is, I think, maybe the single best avenue to, uh, to explore. Philosophers like to say physics is closed. The laws of physics need leave no room for consciousness to play a role. But in fact, if you look at quantum mechanics, there is this weird standard process of wave function collapsing that happens occasionally in a way tied to measurement such that, you know, boy, if you wanted to find a role for consciousness in the physical world, you couldn't do much better than that. Now, it's true that quantum mechanics doesn't force this view on you and there are alternatives, but I still think um, it's worth exploring. Physicists reject this view, I think for the most part, because it's dualistic because it says consciousness is fundamental, and mm -hmm. not physical, but in the context of a view where we're taking seriously the idea that consciousness might be fundamental and play a role, then it's worth taking seriously. The main thing, the main tricky part is really to figure out how the mathematics works. Uh, in my view, that you know, there are the, world, the quantum mechanical world is superposition, somehow is superposed, and somehow when consciousness can evolve, it collapses down. I've been working on this lately with a uh, a postdoc um, used to be a student of mine at ANU, Kelvin McQueen, and now he's a postdoc in physics in uh, at Tel Aviv. We've actually come up against a couple of problems in the mathematical theory. The, the biggest problem of which is how does consciousness ever get started in the, uh, in the early universe? We've got whole branches of, in the early universe there's no consciousness, so it's a massive superposition of different branches of the world, and then somehow a tiny bit of consciousness evolves in a, uh, in, in one of the branches, and then somehow the wave function has to collapse onto one. The trouble is, at the very first moment, consciousness is so tiny, and the amplitude of the wave function goes with the square of tiny, which is tiny, tiny, and it basically means that with probability of one, consciousness is gonna snap out of existence, and you'll be back to a world of zombies. So consciousness never gets started. So it uh, turns out there's a mathematical version of that, which is a serious worry for the theory. It also has the unfortunate consequence that it's very difficult to wake up from a nap. If, uh, <laughs> you fall asleep, your brain's unconscious, a little bit of conscious, a glimmer of consciousness snaps out. So, okay, we've got to work on the mathematics of the, uh, of the theory. But I do think so that's I, I don't, um, I don't, I, I would like, actually one of the problems is, if you are a panpsychist, if you do take this seriously, and I, I don't like the view, but I find myself driven toward it, is that you would expect um, consciousness to play that there would be more gaps in our physical theories, right? Mm. That they're really, that it would show up more. Um, I don't actually hold to this version, of this interpretation of quantum mechanics because I um, actually, I'm uh, not surprisingly, I'm a uh, advocate of Bohm's interpretation mm. Mm. of quantum mechanics where there is in fact uh, a real trajectory um, uh, that it, and the, choreographed by the wave function, right? And the wave function is real and the trajectories are real um, and, that it explain, and that explains everything. I think it's a very elegant um, explanation of, of quantum mechanics. But, um, so I, I don't, I, I'm not driven to the, I'm not 
you know, driven to this view that consciousness is playing a role here. But I do think it is a challenge to those of us who take panpsychism seriously. Why is, why is physics not more gappy? If, if consciousness is built in to the intrinsic uh, <clears throat> ontology of matter, why, uh, why, does, why does physics work so well? It does get weird, though. Physics gets weirder as we zoom in on the micro-micro. Well. So there's, there's that. I mean, uh, but, but um, well, we, should, we should probably go to Q&A uh, soon. Let me ask one question of both of them before we do. And it's just, um, uh, you know, I'm not going to ask you to get into the meaning of your lives, what gives your life meaning in some specific sense. But the generic question, would life have any meaning would morality have any meaning if there were no consciousness, if it were not like something to be alive? You know, if we were zombies, robots with no interior life, would life have meaning? No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, agree? I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's the whole meaning also is an aspect of, of, of consciousness, right? Uh, I mean, and I don't just mean semantic meaning, but, no, but, but you course, know, yeah. whatever you want to call it, spiritual meaning, meaning, meaning. Yeah, I mean, because we are these, you know, we are subjects, we have these experiences, we have a sense of our lives, uh, the narrative of our lives, mm -hmm. you know, um, that I, uh, you know, whatever that consists in, I know what, you know, I, I have memories of my former self. I and, have and, and they may fears feel... from, and hopes for my future. I mean, this whole, it's all a description in terms of, of consciousness. Uh, that's, that's, you know, um, it's, it's the burden, right? It's mm. why uh, we, um, you know, we worry about things like the meaning of our lives and, uh, and despair and all of that. But it's... Um, uh, there is no such question. I mean, this water bottle is not. Unless its, it's meaning is to take care of my thirst, right? It's, unless you're a panpsychist, in which case it has some intrinsic meaning. But, but David, do you have a yeah. do you, would you would you second the no answer to that? Life life would have no meaning if there were no consciousness. Yeah, I think I would. I'm I'm attracted to the idea that consciousness is the ground of all meaning and all value. In our lives, it's very, you know, if there was no consciousness, it's awfully hard to see where the where the value lies and where the uh, where the the meaning lies. In fact, I'm inclined to think that in a way this provides a certain answer to people who say, "Well, it's strange that consciousness doesn't do anything." Just so you're attracted to those views where consciousness doesn't do anything. So, well, that's kind of a why should consciousness demean itself by having to uh, to do something? It's like it's as if you say consciousness would only be valuable if it if it affected something else in the world, but actually consciousness is the locus of value, is the source of value and meaning in our lives. It's, here's the role of consciousness, it's so that there'd be meaning and value in the world. I'm, sometimes I'm attracted to, uh, you're getting a little, to, to you're, that you're, way. You're, you're approaching theology here. Bit, if I were you, I would be, yeah. I would yes. be careful yes. before yeah. uh, you were deemed. Uh, I mean, and also, I mean, why are there, um, you know, why, why are there uh, ethical truths about how we treat other you know, people and also, uh, you know, animals, conscious things. I mean, right. it's, it's the consciousness. Right. If, if, if there were not uh, suffering and pleasure and so on, moral discourse, it's hard to imagine it having a lot of, you know, you know, caring much how you treated other beings if it weren't like anything to be them. Not to speak of personal relations, love mm -hmm. and, you know, all of that. You know, it's, uh, it's, all, it's all grounded. This is actually codified in some of the classic moral theories, like, say, utilitarianism, which says it's all about... Sure. You know, do what creates the most pleasure and the right. least pain. What are those states of consciousness? I mean, I kind of think this thesis is a bit too limited. It's not just pleasure and pain, but it captures that idea that it's all yeah. about, ultimately, about effects on conscious beings. Right. So, I mean, I guess next time anyone encounters someone they feel is guilty of so-called scientism, in other words, claiming that science has answered all problems and we don't need philosophers or anything. I mean, it is worth pointing out that like, the one thing that I think many people would say gives life meaning is the thing that seems most resistant so far, at least, to scientific explanation and maybe resistant in principle by virtue of the fact that it's private and not publicly observable. But, but in any event, uh, we do not yet understand it. So, um, so let's go to, uh, we have time for a few questions. Yes, sir, back uh, in about the fourth row there. Uh, do we have a microphone? Yeah, we're gonna, we can get you a microphone if you, uh, 
want to identify yourself, feel free. If you're uh, hi, my name is Michael Kaminowitz. Um, I know this uh, idea probably doesn't jive with uh, what you've been saying about consciousness as being a fundamental property of the universe. I'm wondering if anyone on stage um, sees a fundamental property between consciousness and uh, an inner emotional life, because um, that seems to cleave the problem pretty neatly. Um, you know, it kind of explains uh, that machines obviously wouldn't be conscious um, without having uh, any subjective experience of any feelings, and you know, um, it kind of, I, there's no reason that the universe should co work with, towards our intuitions, but it kind of coincides with our intuitions of what animals might have some consciousness and what wouldn't. So, um, so but let me be clear, you're distinguishing between emotions and other parts of consciousness. I think most people would call emotions a part of consciousness, the experience of emotions. I'm right, I'm, 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 I mean emotions are, um, consciousness is required for emotions, are they not? I mean, can you oh, have I sadness so, so, without having a subjective experience of it? So I'm wondering if there's any, I, possibility that the two might actually be synonymous. And, uh, uh, being conscious and having emotions are, they're, they're tantamount. To some degree synonymous, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, you know, I, I, I think that um, consciousness covers a, a wide range of um, uh, aspects of our inner, of inner life. Um, and uh, so the perceptions are, 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 are conscious and uh, dreams and uh, thinking about the problem, hard problem of consciousness is conscious and emotions as well. Um, now, interestingly, Spinoza actually, you know, um, thought that uh, all, all inner states um, have a, a cognitive aspect to them um, and an emotional aspect hmm. to them. Um, and so he would he would, he would agree with you that, uh, in fact, all of, um, at least our inner states, uh, you know, even thinking about mathematics or being confused about the hard problem of consciousness um, or just thinking about it or, you know, is, there's always an emotional aspect of it. That was a very important, and that's one of the reasons that the um, neuroscientist uh, uh, Antonio Damasio wrote a book called, you know, Looking for Spinoza or something. He said, you know, that this amazing, the 17th century uh, philosopher was able to somehow presciently see um, what's coming out of his own laboratory, that the intellect and the emotions are enmeshed with one another. So, you know, there's, there is a neuroscientific uh, um, evidence for, I think, the claim that you're making. I'm inclined to go over the view that emotion is part of consciousness and emotional experiences are very important kinds of conscious experiences. And maybe many of our conscious experiences are imbued with affect or emotion. It's not obvious to me that they all have to be. I mean, it certainly seems to me that I have visual experiences which are affectively neutral, at least, uh, at least some of the time. I'd take one of these hypothetical Vulcan cases, you know, Mr. Spock, who allegedly never has any emotions. Well, I think I can make sense of the idea who's, of someone who's conscious but affectively neutral in these ways without emotions. It might be kind of boring to be there, much less interesting than what it's like to be us. But still, I'd be inclined to see affect or emotion as one dimension among many of mm -hmm. consciousness rather than the defining dimension. I do think in psychology, more and more, it's the view that affect or feeling is more finely intertwined with cognition and perception than was once thought and the kind of idea that, well, there's a cognitive part of the brain and the emotional or affective part is kind of falling by the wayside. And some people, I think, question whether there is such thing as, as they say, an immaculate perception, you know. Um, but uh, but it's, an, it's an interesting question. Are there other, um, uh, how about in the third row, conveniently by the, near the microphone? Um. Whenever you were mentioning panpsychism uh, and uh, then we get into uh, quantum theory, something just popped into my head, and I'm just <laughs> going to throw it out there. Do you think there's a way to generate a uh, like a parallel between panpsychism and maybe an approach from uh, the Higgs boson, since they seem to be everywhere? It's also a part of matter. We also get like M theory, and it becomes like it's still 
a uh, material approach to it. But then again, like you said, like there's so much matter, we still don't know physics works for our little space, you know, when we go to super big structures like the universe and it comes in theory, we don't know what that is. And we, when we go to the little stuff, you know, the, the big band, the singularity, we don't know that that is. But then again, like the Higgs boson and then mm -hmm. would that be really, and then you can go to gravity and the problem of the observer and et cetera. <laughs> by, the way, by the way, speaking of the Higgs yeah. boson, uh, the next in the series of these conversations, uh, a week from tomorrow on Wednesday is Lawrence Krauss, the physicist who wrote a universe from nothing. And it's, it's uh, the conversation is called, I think, Physics, Philosophy, and the New Atheism. Uh, Lawrence is a famously ardent uh, new atheist. The only thing I know about the Higgs boson, and it surprised me when I heard this, is that it's apparently a particle or sometimes describes a field, but, but it's what imparts mass to all the other particles. I mean, who, who would have dreamed that left to their own devices they would have no mass? But beyond that, I have no comprehension of the Higgs boson. So maybe we just need to find the new particle, which is the one that imparts consciousness right. to, uh, yeah. to all it, things. It, it, the, uh, maybe it is the Higgs boson, because it seems yeah. to be you know, an element of everything. Um, so You heard it here first. If this, if this <laughs> turns out to be the truth, and by the way, I just want to say, I was, when David said that, I was actually thinking it myself. So Three-way Nobel Prize, people? What? Three-way Nobel Prize? <laughs> it's, it's happened before. <laughs> um, Probably never about consciousness. Um, in the second row there. Uh, thank you. Um, going back to the dualistic interactionism that we were talking about before, it seems to me that in my study of the subject matter, and I'm not an expert on it, but I, I do follow a lot of the popular science on it, and neuroscience and philosophy of mind, it seems to me that uh, all the evidence is showing that brain is always causing mind. There's like a one-way directionality of causation. And so doesn't that pretty much rule out the interaction part in that it's only one way from brain to mind? And um, <clears throat> uh, doesn't it um, seem like, uh, uh, you know, obviously like that would rule out um, dualism. But uh, uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, is there any good evidence at all that the mind, some non-physical part of the mind, causes the physical brain? It seems to me from, from my understanding that there is no evidence for that. It's all brain to mind. So I would like to, what, what are your thoughts on that? And I think you're, you're right that the, uh, the primary evidence we have suggests that affecting the brain affects the mind. I mean, the primary evidence we have also is, is very suggestive that affecting the mind affects the brain and that I'm conscious of something, I can then talk about it. So it looks at a f on first view as if the mind is also affecting the brain. I'd say it's more that the worry comes when you try to reconcile that with what we know about physics and neuroscience and the other sciences. That it's just very hard to see how there's room in what physics tells us about the brain and about about matter in general, for consciousness that's distinct from that to play any role. So that's why people then go around looking for special ways it might play a role, maybe through quantum mechanics, maybe through panpsychism and somehow. But, you know, the evidence at the beginning, it seems just obvious that the mind affects the, uh, affects the brain. So it's really that question of rather of... You mean the like mind the real affects the brain or the brain affects the mind? I mean, prima facie, both are obvious, right? I think something I can talk about it. Okay. But the real challenge isn't the initial evidence, but reconciling it, I think, mm. with everything else we know. So I, um, <clears throat> you know, when you said, what would it be like for Plato to, uh, mm. to be up here and listen to all this? So actually, one of my chapters, I actually, I bring Plato back into our world and I subject him to all sorts of experiences. And one of the things that I subject him to, it was actually the last chapter, is um, he goes to a Harvard neuroscience lab and he gets an fMRI. And, um, and he gets into a discussion with the two neuroscientists about, and there's actually his Timaeus. He become, he's, a, he's a bit of a materialist mm. there. He's, he's really quite an amazing, um, he, he actually says that uh, the thinking goes on in the skull. Uh, Aristotle said it took place in the heart, but he said it was mm. the skull. Anyway, um, but I, I went and I took an fMRI 
so that I would know what it was like, so I could write about it. You have to do that sort of thing. So, um, but what did they do? They had me um, solve mathematical problems. They had me, and, the, and they were looking at what my brain was doing while I was doing this mental stuff. Um, they had me um, place money on various bets and see what my self-control was like, whether I needed the reward right away or whether I could wait a little bit. And, um, you know, so it was, they were asking me what I was thinking of, and they were taking pictures of my brain. Um, and this is highest state of neuroscience right now. It's compatible with anything, right? They're locating, um, it's even compatible with dualism, because we, even Descartes said there is a constant interaction. So whenever something's going on mentally, something's going on in the brain. Um, and that's basically what they were asking me to do. So I don't even think, although I'm a materialist, I mean, I think it's matter. Um, I don't, I think, you know, given all the scientific evidence, it's still wide open, even Cartesian dualism. Um, and, you know, if anybody wants to believe in an afterlife, uh, well, you Who require... doesn't want to believe in an afterlife? I but do you have good news for us on that front? <laughs> no, I, but it does require um, Cartesian dualism. I mean, it would require that we are something other than our material bodies, and that something well, else, else other can can uh, actually contain our, our identity. Can't, can't you imagine an epiphenomenal consciousness that could be like transplanted to some other information processing device in heaven or somewhere and you'd have continuity of experience? But epiphenomenalism, as I understand it, is still, a, it's material. It's not causally doing anything. No, it's, not, it's, it's still, not causally doing anything, but, but, it, but, it, but, it, but, but in principle, an epiphenomenal consciousness could survive in principle, transfer to a different information process. Maybe I'm getting too started. Maybe I can gradually upload my consciousness to, uh, say, a computer by replacing my silicon, my neurons one at a time by silicon chips. So maybe God could gradually replace my neurons one at a time by the ectoplasm or whatever that angels have. And mm -hmm. my, my consciousness could very quickly be uploaded into into heaven? Would that Isn't be that good Kurt, enough? That, that, and Kurzweil has this idea uh -huh. of Yeah, right, I think right, that, that, that's that got Silicon Valley startup written all over it, I gotta <laughs> <Yeah>. say. Um, <laughs> and I wanna get in on the ground level. Um, okay, so in this, in the, I was gonna point to uh, uh, the man in the second row. Why don't you both ask questions, because we're getting short on time. So if you could be brief, uh, both of you, uh, you in the second row, y yes, uh, and um, and then her, uh, just ask your questions in succession. Well, I was just wondering uh, that um, this state of consciousness doesn't seem to have a degree uh, like intelligence might. You have a, some people have a higher IQ and a lower IQ, but even someone with a low IQ could be conscious. And also, there seems to be this complementary unconsciousness of being asleep, most mm -hmm. a part of your life, that is not covered. We're, we're interested in the consciousness part. Mm -hmm. So is there quality okay, so are consciousness? There, are there degrees of consciousness is his question. If you could pass the microphone to her. And then what the heck, we'll go to the gentleman behind you, get three questions asked uh, in succession. And, and let them respond as they may. Okay, yeah. thanks. Um, I'm wondering if it would be plausible to think that consciousness evolved when language evolved, and I'm thinking particularly full human language with syntax, ability to talk about past, future, zombies, everything like that. It, it just seems like such a natural connection to consciousness. Okay. This is good. Admirably concise, these, these questions. Uh, okay, hi. Uh, my question is basically, so consciousness is pre-linguistic or supralinguistic in the sense that it doesn't need language to operate. I think that good, good follow-up to her question, certainly. Yeah. <laughs> uh. So the thing that I'm I'm Peruvian, so I come from a different background than yours. And the thing is that okay, so in reality is information, and we decode it as human beings into functional or experiential ways. So that's the thing we do, I think. But uh, consciousness is something that exceeds our language in a way, so we cannot explain it through language or mathematics, that's another language basically. So the limit of the tool is basically what's impeding us to like more appropriately uh, explain what consciousness is. And my question goes back to, with all due respect, is 
So um, you were talking about the possibility that everything is consciousness in a way that matter has inscribed in its code or whatever uh, consciousness in, in it. And its relationship with the fact that during psychedelic experiences, you get this translinguistic, quote unquote, supralinguistic information that doesn't need language per se for you to understand it. So my, my question would be, don't you think that's a really important way to focus the study of consciousness in a supralinguistic, post-verbal um, way? Okay, so are, are there degrees of consciousness? <laughs> and then a few questions floating around about consciousness and language, I think. Um, and you're, you're free to respond to... Uh, Rebecca, do you have a response to either well, of those? Well, I do think... Um, I do think that the acquisition of language requires consciousness. Um, and any of you who have ever watched uh, a young child um, re acquire uh, uh, language, I mean, it's miraculous, actually. It's an amazing thing. But I mean, it's all, um, you know, that they are, you know, observing. I mean, there's this input and, and, and there's, you know, whatever is going on. So I, I don't think that um, language is a necessary condition for the existence of consciousness, otherwise we, we wouldn't be able to look quite young. Oh, the evolution of language, um, I see. So, well, you know, I think animals are conscious. Um, Descartes actually had an argument like that, because uh, Descartes thought that consciousness was a kind of stuff. You know, like water is a kind of stuff, and you get water, you get all the properties of water, you know, it's going to boil at 100 degrees centigrade and freeze at zero. And Well, consciousness is like that. You get consciousness and you get all the stuff of it, and it doesn't require all that much uh, consciousness to get language, he said. Well, he was, he was wrong about does, that. Does this, yeah. this speaks to the degrees of consciousness question? It, I mean, for one thing, would you say young. animals have less than us in some sense, or pre-linguistic animals? I mean, or? they have a, um, you know, uh, do they have less than us? I mean, they don't have all the, all the capacities of consciousness mm -hmm. that, that we have, many of which um, depend on language, right? So... Uh, you know, all this higher cogitation that we're engaged in right now. I mean, there's no way that any of this could take place without, without language. But uh, there are lower, there are different types of, of consciousness mm -hmm. and, uh, and lower degrees of consciousness. Thank you. David, do you have any? I'm inclined to think there's a lot of, I mean, talk of levels of co or degrees of consciousness is a little bit dangerous. I don't mind doing it, but I think there's probably lots of different ways of measuring consciousness and putting a degree on it or putting levels onto it. You could measure the brute amount of information. You could measure the number of different kinds of consciousness, like sensory modality. You could mention the, measure the complexity of things that a system can think about. So, um, I think degrees I mean, of, of information. Like how yeah, that's one. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good measure. Giulio Tononi, uh, the, uh, the guy who's responsible for information integration theory, has a single measure that he calls phi. It's uh, just the amount of information integration in the system. And he, th he thinks that's a measure of the amount of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So hi-fi, lots of consciousness. Lo-fi, not much consciousness. I'm inclined to think there's lots of measures of consciousness uh -huh. and no single one that we should privilege. And intelligence, I'm inclined to think, is somewhat independent of consciousness, although there may be some interaction. Likewise, language, I'm inclined to think, affects consciousness, but I wouldn't want to make it a prerequisite. I'm inclined to think pain, for example, very plausibly exists in infralinguistic creatures that haven't developed language. But maybe what it does is it articulates our consciousness. It makes it much richer. We can start to think about things consciously that we couldn't previously have thought about thanks to having concepts which are provided to us through being in a culture that has a language with, with so many words. Maybe we can come to see things that we couldn't see before. If I didn't have the concept of a painting, maybe I couldn't even see that painting as a, as a painting. So I'm inclined to think the role of language is to richer and articulate our consciousness rather than to make us conscious in the first place. Okay. And, and you had also mentioned um, sort of a trans-linguistic uh, consciousness, and did you mention psychedelic? Uh, yeah. yeah. But I think, you know, even, you know, normal experience is uh, that um, I, as a writer, I struggle constantly to try to put things in words and often find I can't. Right, that you know, so coming up against the limits mm -hmm. of language, even in explaining mm -hmm. consciousness or the subjectivity of characters, um, you know, it doesn't require, I don't think, you know, sort of uh, 
drugs or you know, normal experience is, uh, is very hard to capture. And there's, there's William James's uh, definition of a mystical experience as noetic but ineffable, meaning it imparts knowledge, but you can't articulate um, the knowledge. So I think we're getting a little on time. Maybe we'll do what we just did, which is pick, pick two or three, have two or three people ask in succession. Um, so way back in the blue, um, and then we have two people right together here, and then let's make that the final three. Hi, um, all of you have kind of said this, or maybe some of you have said this to varying degrees, but um, have kind of implicated that the tools of science are either ineffective or insufficient for like tackling the really hard problems of this issue, but um, what like hypothetical scientific study would convince you that science would have the tools to sort of break the shell of this issue? Okay. Good, good, clear question. Uh, Mr. Ray, you've mentioned that you've seen that there's a greater trend of more and more complexity in the world and in human society, civilization and stuff. How exactly do you measure complexity and how, like some scientists have said that the human brain is the most complex object in the un known universe. How are they measuring that? What is the, how do you quantify complexity? And does that have any relation to consciousness? Okay. Um, my question is a little bit related to the question about science and also to uh, Tononi's theory, uh, integrated information theory, which, um, it, though I don't think, it, though he thinks maybe that's a measure, we could, we could understand that it wouldn't be necessarily a final theory, but if we had, something like that. It was a final theory that could make testable predictions about consciousness, about conscious experience, about the um, kinds and states of consciousness that were possible. Would that, or if not that, then what would actually um, conceivably hope to solve the quote unquote hard problem, change the landscape of how we understand the scope of the problem? Okay, so two questions about what might constitute a, a kind of breakthrough. What, what kind of scientific experiment might, uh, might help? And then uh, the question about Tononi's uh, kind of phi thing. And then a, a question kind of related about how you'd measure complexity and what the connection of that is to consciousness. I mean, that one was directed at me, so let me, I'll, I'll answer it and then get out of the way. Um, I, you know, I'm tempted to say about complexity, what, whatever Supreme Court justice that was said about pornography, I know it when I see it. I mean, you know, humans, bacteria, I'll let you choose. Um, you know, in, in the macroscopic kind of evolutionary scale, everyone kind of agrees that uh, some things are more complex than others. Um, I do think that biological complexity, I think a lot of people suspect, that is correlated with the kind of degree of consciousness, that, that we are in some sense more consciousness, more fully conscious than a bacterium, if, if bacteriums are, or, or if they're not, then, then my dog. Uh, the, um, and I, uh, yeah, you're right, I've argued that, that the growth of complexity is a very likely thing through biological evolution, and, and for that matter, through subsequent um, cultural evolution, the growth of social complexity. As for biological evolution, I do think if these things are true, if natural selection is very likely to produce more and more um, biologically complex beings, and biological complexity is correlated kind of with extent of consciousness, and if, as we've said, consciousness is what gives life meaning, then natural selection is like a meaning-creating machine. Um, and of course, you know, I've also, well, not of course, but you probably know, since you asked the question, I mean, I've argued that there's reason to think that maybe natural selection in some sense has uh, a larger purpose. If I were gonna elaborate on this, I would emphasize in some sense, it doesn't necessarily mean some kind of God created it, but in some sense, a larger purpose could be unfolding through natural selection. And I'm talking about a strictly naturalistic view of natural selection, just a physical machine, <clears throat> uh, but maybe it was in some sense set in motion to do something. So that's uh, so much for me. Uh, do you want to take turns responding to as much of that? I'm going to, yeah, very quickly. Um, so what would convince me um, would be if I, uh, if, if I 
when I got that fMRI and the neuroscientist looked at my brain and, and then he said to his colleague, by golly, she sees yellow the way I see blue, right? Her experience is entirely different. And she just, she just gave us the answer that she would, you know, rationally choose, you know, wait for the reward of the money to, she's lying. I, I can see, you know, what she really thinks uh, by her neurons firing, by, you know, the loops between her cerebral cortex and her thalamus. I know exactly what it's like to be her. That is what I would want. That's what we get in other reductions in science. Uh, if I get a description of you know, a pot of water in terms of the motions of its molecules, um, I can get out all of its thermo uh, dynamic, all, all of its, uh, you know, uh, chemical and uh, thermodynamical uh, properties from that. I oh gosh, it's moving like that. It's boiling. Look, it, the molecules are, you know, have have air in them. This thing is so. That's what I would. That's what I would require. Um, or from my behavior, or from my functional uh, description, or from you know cognitive sciences. Uh, representation of the computations uh, that are that I'm doing uh, in in my mind, they would be able to deduce all of these of these qualities, uh, and that's that's what we get in reduction. And and when they can do that, um, then the privacy will be gone. Privacy is a measure of the incompleteness of the reductions. Uh, we're only private because. Uh, a physical description can't get at our qualities of, uh, of, of consciousness. Yes, on the, um, on the first question, I think I want to take issue with the premise of the question, which was that all of us have expressed skepticism about whether science can accommodate consciousness. I haven't said anything, anything like that. I've expressed skepticism about whether reductionism can accommodate consciousness. I think it's really important in these matters not to, not to identify science uh, the enterprise with reductionism, one particular kind of philosophical view. I'm very much in favor of um, the science of consciousness. I kind of see myself as devoting my life to trying to help develop a scientific theory of consciousness. I helped to start the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness, which is just about to have its 20th meeting, uh, bringing together psychologists, neuroscientists, philosophers, and other people to have a science of consciousness. I just don't think the ultimate science is going to be reductionist. And in fact, the science which is going on right now, it's extremely rich. Uh, science involving psychologists looking at connecting consciousness to behavior, neuroscientists connecting it to the brain. But it's just not reductionist at all. It's people are finding correlations between brain processes and consciousness, correlations between behavior and consciousness. Almost nobody claims to have you know, crossed the explanatory gap or solved the hard problem, rather we're getting richer and richer, what I would say non-reductive theories that correlate brain processes with consciousness. And I think what we need to do is ultimately come up with, and this now gets in the territory of the last question as well, come up with more and more systematic and principled correlations between physical processes and consciousness. To me, those will be the fundamental laws of consciousness and akin to fundamental laws in physics. Physicists say they want laws so simple you can write them on the front of a, uh, of a t-shirt so I want laws of consciousness so simple that we can write them on the front of a t-shirt. One thing I like about Tononi's theory is at least seems to have that form. It's, okay, it's complicated mathematically, but still pretty simple. And so what would convince me is if somebody come up with, here are my fundamental principles of consciousness. And here's what I can do. I can take a measure of your brain, say from the fMRI or from an even more complete brain scanner in the future and apply my principles of consciousness to that, to say here is exactly the kind of conscious state that we would predict someone in, my brain, in that brain state would be in. They'd measure my state, they'd apply those principles, and they'd say here's the conscious state you're in. I'd introspect and I'd find, yeah, that's just right. That's the, uh, that's the, uh, the conscious state that I'm having. I wouldn't myself see that as reductionist, unlike uh, the, the view that Rebecca was talking about. I'd see that as non-reductionist because it would be a principle of the fundamental connection between physical processes and consciousness. But I'd still see it as scientific. 
And we're not remotely close yet, I think, to a scientific theory at that level, but I don't see why one day we shouldn't be at that level, and when we are at that level, maybe we will actually have a fundamental scientific theory of consciousness. Okay, well, thank you. Um, thanks again to all of you for coming out in the face of inclement weather and for being so attentive, and to the questioners among you for being concise and clear. Um, thanks to both of you for coming here. Um, under non-ideal circumstances, Rebecca just flew in from Abu Dhabi and professes to be jet-lagged, although it didn't show, I must say. Um, David uh, taught, a, uh, uh, I think, a two- or three-hour seminar this afternoon, and in my experience, teaching a multi-hour seminar is as draining as flying in from Abu Dhabi, because when you teach a seminar, you're the one person in the room who has to actually pay attention to everything that is said, and that, that kind of takes a toll. So um, before I liberate you to go watch the Republican debate, I, I want to thank both of them for... Uh, <laughs>